Welcome to From the Quarries. Tonight's video, an essay on the mysteries and the true object of the Brotherhood of Freemasons, has an interesting backstory. It was first published anonymously in French in 1774, and then was found by W. H. Rees in the mid-19th century, who published an English translation in 1862. It takes the form of a letter to an anonymous Monsieur de la H. In his preface to the work, Rees explains how he discovered the text in an old bookshop in London in the 1850s, and adds, The motives which Freemasonry requires shall actuate every candidate for initiation into its mysteries, a general desire for knowledge, and a sincere wish to render himself more extensively serviceable to his fellow creatures. One of the objects of the writer of this essay, of which the following is a free translation, appears to have been to show the uninitiated that the latter of the motives above mentioned forms truly a fundamental part of the institution of Freemasonry. That being said, I hope you enjoy the presentation. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's presentation, From the Quarries, an archive of Masonic Law. Yes, Monsieur, it is true, I am a Freemason, and I thank you for the honour you have done me in requesting my opinion upon that order, which you wrongly designate by the word sect. I do not ignore anything which the silly fancy of weak and presumptuous minds has devised on the subject of the gravest and most respectable society which has ever existed upon the earth. Those who know all the underhanded dealings of such persons have great reason to reflect on the illusions of the human mind and upon the judgments which the profane multitude form. I undertake with all my heart to satisfy you and to withdraw you from error and by giving you an idea as true as it is rational of the order of the Freemasons. The enlightenment of the present age is sufficient to prove to us that man is depraved and that it is to society alone we must attribute the cause. The corruption of education, the excessive inequality of fortunes, and still more the passion for power and authority have vitiated in the human heart the primitive sentiments of nature and have rendered it wretched and unhappy. A certain metaphysical code filled with as much with sophistries and errors as it is considered sublime and rational, has, on the other hand, misled the minds of men. The founders of the Masonic Society proposed to themselves no other end than that of restoring man to his primitive goodness, and of causing a revival in his heart of the laws of nature in their greatest perfection. Religion has had the same end in view, and it is likewise that which the municipal laws propose in all the governments of the earth. It is Freemasonry alone which has understood the best means of accomplishing this. The aim of that society is, then, to make man humane, rational, virtuous. In order to effect this, it is fought to dissipate his errors, to soften his manners by the innocent pleasures of life, and to assist and comfort him in his wants. The members of that society are all brothers, who are not distinguishable by the language they speak, nor by the garments they wear, by the opinions they hold, nor by the dignities and fortunes they possess. Equality is their primary law. Following this system, the whole world is looked upon by them as a republic, of which each nation is a family, and each individual a son. The individuals of that society, being all brothers, and brothers who make a profession of being rational and virtuous, have an express duty to love and aid each other reciprocally. 
to conduct themselves with uprightness and honesty towards other men, and to be good and faithful citizens of the state. This order, destitute of all coercive force, has no other support than that of moral force. It is then under the necessity of making its members sensible and virtuous. It is from that its other laws are derived, which have for their sole object union, order, harmony, decency of manners, tranquillity of mind. To prevent these things being altered, they have been obliged to forbid the presence of women in their meetings, without ceasing at the same time to honour them. It is, for the same reason, expressly forbidden to discuss in Lodge any point of theology or of politics, or even to speak of them, or to use obscene and indecent words. Truth, justice, prudence, moderation, good faith, charity, are the virtues which ought to reign in the heart of a Freemason. Without saying anything more, you can easily understand that the institution and the end of this respectable society is to improve man and perfect his morality. In the best regulated civilized society, you will not find any law which supports in a similar manner its individuals and assists them in their wants. We see often that the virtuous man, full of merit, groans under the weight of oppression and unhappiness. But the constitution of the order of Freemasons is such that each of its members ought to find a sure and efficacious support in the society of which he forms a part, and in the authority of the brethren who compose it. An unfortunate man who is oppressed by power, by calumny and by hatred is often lost for want of succour. Is he a Freemason? It will be easy for him to find in every nation a country, brethren, protectors, and sometimes even a fortune. Humanity, that fine and noble virtue which embraces all others, which is the object of sound philosophy, and which is the support of the Christian religion, is the soul of Freemasonry. Divine and tranquil friendship, lovely passion of the wise and virtuous, in which is to be found the true happiness of life, is a mask for all men, whilst it is a duty among Freemasons. It unites them by the easy ties of beneficence and decent pleasures. And we must only regard as a permitted relief those moments which they take to withdraw themselves from the affairs of business and the malice of mankind in passing some hours of the night in innocent labours and in merry repasts in company with honest and joyous friends. We must not judge the Society of Freemasons solely from its mysteries, its language, its customs, its emblems. Men are sensible beings who conduct themselves more by lively impulse of fancy than by the cold calculations of reason. Reasonings are only good for those among them who are very rational, and when they do not nourish the imagination, they are more often arid and devoid of attraction. One is sometimes obliged to have resource to these wholesome prejudices, which in the human heart have so much strength that they supply the place of law and virtue. The ancient priests of Isis and Eleusinian Ceres made use of symbols, figures, and superstitious ceremonies to correct vices and abuses. A society which has but moral force ought then, by a wise prudence, to make use of those symbols and mysteries which, better than anything else, can produce in the heart and the mind of its members sentiments capable of making them love their labours and their duties. In effect, these symbols and mysteries are the principal nourishment of the human mind. The fool is dazzled by them. The inquisitive man is lost and confounded. It is the philosopher alone who perceives with an internal satisfaction the expression of his principles and his ideas. If these mysteries 
make sometimes fan- fanatical enthusiasts, the skillful and judicious man enjoys in silence the advantage Freemasonry procures for him. The aim of the Masonic Mysteries is then to refresh the mind, to preserve harmony and to form the heart. The allegory of this society is ingenious and well-sustained. It is proposed to build a temple, and it is the temple of virtue that is to be erected. The instruments of this building are symbols of the architecture of the heart. The square, the triangle, the compass represent equity, justice, honesty. The light alludes to virtue. Man, before being introduced to work in this august temple, that is to say, before entering into the path of virtue, is a wretch who wanders in darkness. If he wishes to be admitted into this temple, he must cleanse himself from his vices by giving sufficient proofs of his constancy and good faith. The gloves and the white aprons with which they clothe the newly initiated brother represent the candour and purity of manners which ought to distinguish a good Freemason. The Masons do not admit any other distinction than that of virtue. They place on a level birth, rank, fortune, when they bestow the first degree. Each of the degrees has a mystic meaning, but all Freemasons are not capable of developing its allegory. You will not find a good Freemason, that is to say, a man sensible and honest, who will reveal to you the mysteries of the society. It has been frequently observed that men, the most indiscreet on other subjects, show themselves impenetrable on this. Those who calumnate this society, because the secret is so religiously observed, do but criticise in the edifice the regularity of its design. Mysteries of this kind can only be kept respectable by keeping them secret, under the obligation of an oath. They cease to be mysteries as soon as they are revealed. In the early ages, the Christian religion was much practised in nocturnal mysteries. Those who were initiated were accused of a thousand turpitudes and of the most frightful infamy, and it was the inviolable secret which they kept that furnished matter for these atrocious calumnies. But Christians are still taught that it is only unlawful and bad things are kept concealed, because those which are good and useful appear in the full light of day. Yes, the fate of all mysterious assemblies has ever been to be calumniated by the public voice and then to be persecuted. But if the guilt of keeping a secret is a necessary virtue in domestic life, would not the best school of morality be, without a doubt, that in which men are taught to be silent? Persons who understand everything literally imagine that Freemasonry is pernicious to the state because its system is based upon equality and liberty. They understand by equality a perfect equality of rank, orders and conditions. It would certainly be very useful if all those of the noble and rich who rule in society would find their true value by frequenting the lodges of Freemasons. But nothing is more absurd nor chimerical than equality, in the sense which is generally attached to that word. Men are not equal, either by strength, by talents, or by stature. Each has, beyond that, the terrible and natural desire to domineer over others, and it would be impossible to make all these individuals perfectly equal. The equality of Freemasons consists in regarding themselves all as brothers, and in rendering to each other the duties of benevolence and charity. Good morals are based upon that equality, and Christian charity has that same principle as its foundation. Every good political government is a moral system, based more upon subordination than is commonly believed. The judgment we bring to bear upon liberty 
is equally unjust. It is generally thought that the doctrine of Freemasons has independence of the law for its aim, and that it regards civil subordination as a yoke which dishonours humanity. Never has a word been so much abused as that of liberty. Metaphysicians still dispute upon the different ideas which should be attached to it. It is folly in them to pretend that all actions are the work of an overpowering reason. There are always some little circumstances which influence those actions which are called indifferent. Philosophers, in carrying these principles too far, have destroyed all kinds of liberty. In ethics, they pretend to give another idea of liberty. Man is born subject to the laws of nature. He ought then to obey, in society, those which have been made for the common interest. Everyone finding his safety, his personal advantage, his happiness in that dependence. The man truly free is he who is rational and virtuous. That is to say, he who obeys the laws and fulfills his duty. And it is clear that equality and liberty are, in the moral sense, equivalent expressions. Every just and moderate government is based upon liberty, since its true end is to guarantee to each citizen the free and tranquil exercise of his faculties. And, in that sense, liberty is a right which all men have received from nature with their existence, for, so that it ought to be permitted for each to use freely his right in fulfilling all the duties of civilised society. Even in love, the sentiment cannot be perfect or real if it be not free. The system of Freemasonry is entirely opposed to irregularity and licentiousness, and admits of no other liberty than moral liberty. The lodges are called free in consideration that virtue ought to be encompassed by love, and that it cannot be either solid or true if it be not practised with a free will and with freedom. It is precisely for this that the workmen of the Temple of Virtue are called in Italy liberi muratori. We have adopted in France the word franchif, a term much more proper to express the liberty of the heart, and it is from it that the epithets of French maçonnier and franc maçon are derived. In order to form a just idea of Freemasons, we should regard them as a society of symbolic philosophers. If you have any knowledge of the character of those who cultivate their minds, you will know that they cannot be in any sense dangerous men. It is possible that they may occupy themselves in speculations, that they may reason uselessly upon useful projects, that they may dispute about things which they are ignorant of and which they do not understand, but at the same time they are wise. They cultivate the pleasures of society and the delights of friendship. The general character of philosophers is simplicity, moderation, gentleness, tranquility. You have seen, often enough, men who have had a taste for philosophy abandon the most brilliant officers of the state to cultivate literature in the silence of retirement. Neither the reasonings nor the enlightenment of modest and tranquil philosophy are the spring of human actions. It is the passions only which put all in motion. The experience of all ages shows us that the state ought not to distrust those who profess to be learned. Dangerous people are those who excite the foolish and fatal passions of the multitude. Now, far from the lodges of Freemasons being able to give birth to these dangerous practices, they form, on the contrary, a most useful and effective school for correcting vice and forming good citizens. The constitution of their order tends solely to the happiness of its members. But, as it has no other support than moral sentiment, it can only fulfil that praiseworthy end by virtue and the perfection of manners. All the secret of Freemasons consists in teaching by symbols, 
that the true science is morality and that the true virtues are the social virtues. Observe, I pray you, Monsieur, that all men, even the most corrupt, love morality. Unquestionably, the great and useful truths are actually become common by means of philosophy, printing, and religion. But that does not prevent, when they are reduced to symbols and figures, their impressing themselves more indelibly on the mind and delighting the imagination. The innocent and chaste pleasures of life, the sweetness and equality of friendship, unity, decorum, tranquility, a lovable and virtuous liberty, are things which satisfy the taste of everybody and produce lively and real pleasure. They are, at the same time, so many secret causes which make the society of Freemasons to subsist and flourish. The most shameful of all calumnies is to say that Freemasonry teaches atheism and irreligion. All is piety and decorum in its innocent mysteries. Freemasons invoke God as the grand architect of the universe, and that expression is noble and sublime. They who believe it possible to have a society which should teach irreligion and cultivate evil practices for any length of time know very little of the human heart. Whenever you hear a permanent society spoken of, you may confidently infer that it has rendered itself respectable by its morality. It is, at the same time, vile and unjust to concur in opinion with ignorant and foolish persons concerning the lodges of Freemasons, which are in fact no other than temples of virtue and sanctuaries consecrated to friendship and humanity. Men who are better informed and more correct in their ideas will never confound these mysterious assemblies with unlawful meetings and sects suspected or hateful to the state. So Monsieur Le Baron in De Beerfield, in his Institutions Politique, says expressly in speaking of law unlawful assemblies, as being always heretofore forbidden in a well-governed state, that the government ought to make a general exception in favour of the Society of Freemasons. An evident and well-demonstrated proof that Masonic assemblies have nothing which can affect the tranquillity of the state is that society which for many centuries has been spread all over the kingdoms of Europe, over several countries of Asia, and over nearly the whole of European America, has not only not produced any disorder, but it is always distinguished by works of beneficence and charity. Although there may be states which, upon frivolous grounds, have not tolerated it, it cannot be denied that many others have, on the contrary, protected and encouraged it. Observe again, monsieur, that the chief characteristic of pernicious assemblies is to withdraw from the eyes of honest men, and above all, from those of the magistrates. Freemasons' lodges, on the contrary, have no reserve except towards the people. If they close their doors to the foolish, to the wicked, and to the vicious, they open them without distinction to all men of merit and quality, and above all, to virtuous men. It is even one of their fundamental maxims to endeavour to admit among them magistrates, ministers of state, and even sovereigns. And truly, how many sovereign princes, how many ecclesiastical dignitaries, how many men are respectable by their office, by their eminent qualities, and by the purity of their manners, are there not counted by the Freemasons in the number of their brethren. Peaceable and humane men have in all times formed small societies in order to live far from discord, the factions and the calumnies which desolate their country. Such have been the gymnosophists in the Indies, the Essenes among the Hebrews, the Pythagoreans in Italy, and the sects of the philosophers in Greece. Concealment was common to all these societies, and they were united by bonds of brotherhood, of disinterestedness, of rigid morality, and works of benevolence and charity. 
although their principles were sometimes extravagant and ridiculous, their virtues did not the less merit them for the respect and admiration of the rest of mankind. One might almost believe that it is an instinct natural to honest men to render themselves distinct, to separate themselves from the vicious and depraved men of the age. But among these sects, there are some wiser than others. They, they are those who have employed all their efforts by symbolic and figurative works to recall others to reason and good morals. If you seriously reflect, Monsieur, upon those famous mysteries which have caused so much good to humanity and to society, you will find that they have more connection with those of the Freemasons than is commonly supposed. As far as the ancients have enabled us to judge, it appears that they concealed all the mysteries under the veil of a most profound secrecy, and for that object, and in order to inspire the initiated of greater veneration for the mysteries, they agreed only to celebrate them in the holy shades of night. They religiously kept the most profound silence. The spectacle was grand and noble, and we know from Maximus of Tyre that it was of a nature to afford a new and delicious pleasure. Admission to participation in those mysteries was called by the Greeks perfection, and by the Latins initia, because the mysteries contained the principles of a tranquil and happy life. It was necessary to pay a certain sum for these initiations, and the candidates were submitted to some rigorous examinations. They were proved by three perilous journeys. They purified them by water, by blood, and by fire. They caused them to catch a glimpse of a thousand confusing and frightful objects, and to hear extraordinary voices. From the most horrid darkness they passed into places light and agreeable, to the light, light being the symbol of truth. The, the initiated had first signs and then words by which they recognized each other, and the Greeks called them symbols. They took an oath of silence and, above everything, of keeping these mysteries inviolably secret. He who had the indiscretion to reveal them was looked upon as a sacrilegious person, a traitor and a monster. He was banished from society and sometimes punished with death. They admitted to these mysteries persons of all grades and of both sexes. The greatest men of antiquity were initiated in them. They cried with a loud voice to warn off the profane, Usite o profani, which was the general formula of all the mysteries. Vagrants, homicides, and generally all the impious and wicked were excluded from them. They did not admit the Epicureans, and from that example Freemasons interdict atheists from entrance into their lodges. The mysteries were communicated by degrees. Each degree had its peculiar ceremonies, and it was not until after many proofs of morals and of conduct that they admitted anyone to perfect initiation. They sang various hymns, which it is generally understood did not contain any allusion to the mysteries or their symbols. We see clearly enough that the general spirit of that wholesome institution was to discipline mankind, to console man in his misery, to help him by its benefits, and to teach him the arts necessary for his subsistence. The lodges of Freemasons may then, like the ancient mysteries, be very useful and salutary. They may become a noble school of learning and morals, to aid more than is supposed the laws and religion. But it is in the nature of all things human that institutions the most advantageous are not always exempt from disorder and abuse. It has not always been possible to prevent some men whose conduct was not the wisest nor the best regulated being admitted into the order of Freemasons. From this it has happened that the temple of virtue has sometimes been profaned by false brethren. But if this has caused disorder and abuse in the society, it has only produced in the minds of wiser brethren derision and contempt. Institutions which may be prejudicial to civilized society demand always 
very serious animadversion. As for the institution of Freemasonry, which may be the most useful and consoling for more ca mankind, it is desirable that it should be protected in every country by the authorities, and that, under the direction of a wise chief, many of its formalities and ceremonies might be corrected and its mode of government in some respects reformed. I have the honour to be, etc, etc.